Okay, I think we're ready. All right, so let me see if I can come up with some sort of description of the alleged topic for today. Um, so I think I did threaten an email that I was gonna talk about Hegner numbers. Uh, maybe I should ask, how much do you know about Hegner numbers? Uh, they are numbers that give you imaginary quadratic fields with class number one. I think that's right. Square root of negative n. Yeah, okay. That's shining that gives you a quadratic number field with class number one, and they give you really interesting things about the J function and well, weird things, weird things like e to the pi times square root of negative 163 is like almost an integer. <laughs> okay, well, we'll go ahead and we'll see how, you know, you know, we'll see to what extent the stuff that you're mentioning here, we'll try to see how that, how that uh, matches up with uh, huh? what I'm going to be talking about. So, uh, so, I mean, that was, that was one possible description of my topic, my alleged topic for today. But another possible description is um, real elliptic curves and perhaps more especially the moduli stack of real elliptic curves. And um, okay, that's more exotic sounding, maybe uh, simpler. <laughs> yeah, and um, the mod, uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So the mod that that's that's our vague idea. The moduli stack of real elliptic curves. That's what we're starting out with. And perhaps as usual, we have some pretty low brow ways to think about this, and some pretty high brow ways to think about it. And we're, we're going to be using a mixture of those low brow and high brow ways. Um, okay. So, so first of all, let me say that. Right, one of the lowbrow things here is that I don't really know what people might even mean when they say the moduli stack of elliptic curves, of real elliptic curves. I, yeah, I don't even know what they mean when they say the moduli stack, stack of elliptic curves. Because I mean, there's a bunch of variations in how you can treat it. But um, uh, the moduli, yeah, and I'm right. And when you say the moduli stack of real elliptic curves, I'm not sure how people feel about that. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, and, and right, because there are lots of different ways, there's lots of different variations on how you could think about this. So I'll mention one variation right up front, and then I'll try to mention where my preference lies. Uh, and then we'll, foc we'll, we'll focus on, we'll, hopefully we'll focus on where my preference lies, but there's actually, there's an entertaining morass of where my preference doesn't lie. And we might end up talking about that too. Uh, so my preference lies when interpreting, in this context, interpreting elliptic curve to mean that it's a group, uh, an abelian group. Um, so, right, I mean, there are some real elliptic curves that I'm not sure if they really qualify. Uh, right, we're used to the idea that elliptic curve is a group object and, and even better, an abelian group object. But if you start dealing with real elliptic curves, then uh, well, so so uh, so okay, right? We have, so roughly speaking, we can think of we can try to get away with thinking of a real algebraic variety as being a complex algebraic variety equipped with. This is very lowbrow. Equipped with a an anti-holomorphic involution. Okay. Right, and so that anti-holomorphic involution has orbits of two kinds, right? It has orbits of size one and size two. Mm -hmm. You know, those orbits of size one, those are the things that they're their own complex conjugate, so those are real points. Mm -hmm. uh, and. Um, the other orbits are, you know, the sort of imaginary or complex, or whatever you call them points, uh, but, the, but coming in matched pairs. Uh -huh. And um, 
So you can sort of picture this real elliptic curve as a sort of folded version of the original complex elliptic curve. Or, you know, uh, uh, you can picture a real about, uh, uh, at, at, the, at the informal level that I'm thinking of, we can picture a real algebraic variety as being a sort of folded version of a uh, complex algebraic variety. Uh -huh. And um, so in some sense, we're trying to understand all the ways that you can fold all the good ways, reasonable ways that you can fold a uh, a complex elliptic curve, uh, you know, a torus, and um, we're trying to understand those. Uh, but in particular, you know, for me, the good ways are the ones where this right. I, okay, maybe I should really say that the good ones are the ones where this folding process is a group homomorphism, a group automorphism. Uh, the folding process, I mean, the involution, the, that the involution uh -huh. should be a, a group automorphism. Uh, so the complex holomorphic maps yeah. an elliptic curve to itself that fix the base point, they're automatically group homomorphisms. To say, that, say that once again, what? <laughs> the complex analytic maps from an elliptic curve to itself that fix yes. a base point are automatically group homomorphisms. So how about the complex, how about the anti-holomorphic maps that fix a base point? Are they all homomorphisms or is there, or is this homomorphism constraint? I'm actually really? confused about that. I'm actually confused uh -huh. about that. Uh, I, I'm, I'm hoping that there actually are some ones that have a base point that are nevertheless, uh, but, 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 but the anti-involution is not a, a, are we saying this right? <laughs> How did you phrase, what, what are you asking? Your question is what? Well, first did I was telling you a famous yeah. fact, and then I was asking you yeah. the parallel question for the anti-holomorphic. So is an anti-holomorphic map from an elliptic complex elliptic curve to itself that fixes the base point automatically a group homomorphism or not. So, I mean, if it was, that would be great, <laughs> but I don't have any. I'm hoping that it isn't, but I'm honestly confused. Uh-huh, okay. Uh, we'll, 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 we'll try to see how it goes. Uh -huh. but, uh, but again, we're already falling into this thing that I don't wanna, worry about too much about yet because I, I you know i claim that the the good ones the nice ones are the ones where the involution is a group homomorphism okay uh, yeah i mean you can just look at those what uh -huh. yeah you can just look at those and show off. but we but we should we should <laughs> we should think a little bit about these other ones because i mean i mean so for example I'm, I, one of the things i think you can get by this folding process is you can get a klein bond You know, if there are no fixed points at all, so there is no base point. So, like, what if we tried something like y? Let me. Let me so let's see. Yeah, I. I, I mm. <laughs> I, I'm. I'm sorry. I'm just tempted to switch screen sharing here, but uh, I guess okay. But but I'll just try to say the equation out loud. I don't want to say something like y squared equals x squared plus x plus two. Sorry, y squared. How about y squared equals the negative of x squared plus x plus two over x squared minus x plus two. Say that again, x squared, the right hand side, x. It's the negative of x squared plus x plus two over x squared minus x minus two. Uh -huh. So, you know, I think if, if you're right, each of those have hopefully have negative discriminant and they have like, uh, you know, I think, right, they each have a pair of, a matched pair of, of complex roots. 
I, I think one of them is like one plus I and one minus I, and the other one is minus one plus I and minus one minus I. So the, you know, the, the four branch points here are gonna be at the corners of a square here. So I think it's just gonna be, you know, a usual square lattice, square period lattice type thing as a complex thing, but the, the top of the numerator is strictly positive. The, the, the numerator is strictly positive. The denominator is strictly positive. I'm sticking a negative sign in there. So I think this is gonna have no real points at all. Was the denominator x squared minus x plus two? X squared minus x plus two. Yeah. If I didn't, uh -huh. if I didn't screw up. Okay. Yeah. That's. I mean, the intent is that the, both the numerator and denominator should be positive, and then we yeah. stick the minus yeah. sign in there, and we take the square root of it, and in that way we ensure that there are no real points. So I think the only thing that that could mean, if I didn't screw up, I think the only thing that, that could mean is that we have a, one of these Klein bottle things. You know, there are no size one orbits, there are only size two orbits. You know, so it looks like a conformal Klein bottle. Uh, okay, well, I'm really confused about, I've never thought about this stuff, so I'm confused about yeah. everything. So like, here's something, <laughs> yeah. here's something I'm confused about. Yeah. So suppose I take, I wanna think it like in a lattice way about, an elliptic curve, a complex yeah. elliptic curve. So yeah. Let me just like take the, the Gaussian lattice as the lattice giving the elliptic curve. Yes. Right? And yes. so then there, and so complex, plain old complex conjugation. Yes. Oh, never mind. Well, okay, no, okay. Again, there are different choices of yeah. complex conjugation here, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. okay. Well, maybe I should try to show you a picture. So, yeah, so that one does have a bunch of fixed points. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So if, if I understand what you're talking about, yeah. Yeah. Maybe I should try to show you a picture of the module X step. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So it's actually a moving picture of the module X step. Okay. So I call this uh, the moduli movie of real elliptic curves. But it's a moduli movie of real elliptic curves in the sense that you know these, these are the ones where the anti-involution is a group involution. So that uh, you know, the real points actually form a group. Um, so uh, well, like I say, it's a moving picture of the moduli stack. So it's uh, a movie, let's see, can I? Start here. Uh, well, let me, okay, let me just warn you that this movie is sort of exciting. Okay. <laughs> All right, so here it goes. And it, 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 it will, it, it, it's exciting if it works. Right, that's what's exciting if I can get a program to work. That's why it's exciting. Right. Can tell what's coming. Point. Is it basically done? <laughs> yeah. No. Well, so, it's it's a uh, it's cyclical great. movie. It's a I cyclical see. movie. Uh huh. Okay. Oh, so it's like a drippy faucet. <laughs> it's like watching a dripping faucet. Yeah. Except so it reminds me of like experimental mm -hmm. movies from the 1960s, you know, like uh, Yoko Ono and um, <laughs> uh, uh, like have a you ever seen faucet in a very uh, where the droplet evaporates before it even has a chance to. The droplet evaporates, but it's not even making a very vigorous effort to fall. If you look at it, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, that's right. it, 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 it's. Uh, it's almost yeah. suspended in midair there. So I'm not sure I understand why it looks like a dripping faucet, but it looks like a dripping faucet. And um, 
you know, so some of the some of the frames in the movie are more exciting than others. Like there's one that happens way too fast right now. Okay. Uh, you want to try to? Well, yeah. well, since I know what it. <laughs> okay, yeah. Since I know what it looks like, I don't. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to get. Yeah, I don't know if, if that frame. Uh, there, yeah, okay. <laughs> it's a little bit. Yeah, I don't think you have exactly that narrow. frame. But that's pretty close. That's pretty damn good. That's yeah. Cool. Uh -huh. Yeah, I'm not even sure the program is capable of really drawing. A, a, so yeah, so that so. So I mean that separation point is one of the cusp points. So I mean, right? Clearly, that's not a group. Well, it, it doesn't look like a topological group to me. It looks like a figure eight, which is not a top, right? There's no, right? A figure eight has the mm -hmm. wrong Euler characteristic to be a topological group. Uh huh. Um, so that cusp yeah. thing where it's right at the moment where the <laughs> droplet, the, the droplet formation, uh -huh. right? that's, that's clearly not a group. But that's you, right. That's a, that's a degenerate elliptic curve. You know, maybe that shouldn't really you shouldn't really call that an elliptic curve. It's a this degenerate point in the modulus step. Um, is that an elliptic curve that this complex version looks like a? Uh, I don't know how to describe it. Like a crescent, <laughs> where where the where the it's like a torus that thins something like that. Point. Uh -huh. Yes. Yes. Two of the branch points coincide. Yes. Uh -huh. um, and, I've uh, never thought about that kind of thing too much. So is that like a, so that's not a topological group either, that complex one, I assume. That's, that's a good question. I, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's not a topological group, but it, it's, it may be, It may be like a topological monoid. It may be like a topological group that's really just the multiplicative group with a point at infinity stuck on or something like that. Um, but, uh, but don't trust me on that. Um, but like, so, so when, uh, when you started posting about uh, abelian varieties on the, you started posting about abelian varieties on the n category cafe semi recently. Yeah. And um, I guess it was David Spire and Jason Starr mentioned a couple of textbooks or historical articles or something like that. Um, I think there was one, uh, I, I think Jason Starr mentioned something by, uh, is it Stephen Kleiman or something like that? Um, some historical thing about maybe the origin of abelian varieties or something like that. But it started with Bernoulli's Lemniscate in oh. 1694, which, um, let me say, let me, let, again, let me just read this one off, write this one down. According to Kleiman, it's x squared plus y squared in parentheses, uh -huh. squared equals a squared times uh, in parentheses, x squared minus y squared. He says that was called Bernoulli's lemniscate, or it was called the lemniscate by Bernoulli. And I think he's indicating that the name lemniscate in this context means that it looks like a figure eight. And this one is a genuine elliptic curve, but, but that confuses me because how can a figure eight which is not a topological group, be a uh, be an elliptic curve, which is a topological. So uh, I'm really confused about this. But my guess, my best guess, is that it is a uh, a topological group at, in the complex realm, but that the you know complex conjugation anti-involution. I'm I'm just forced to guess that that is not a group involution. 
I see. Uh, that's that's. Uh, I, I mean, don't trust me on that at all. I could be really confused, but I mean, right? Isn't that a famous thing that the lemnus gate is an elliptic curve? But another famous thing is that it looks like a figure eight. And another famous thing is that an elliptic curve is a topological group, and a slightly less famous thing is that a figure eight is not a topological group. Uh, so so two, the last two of those, I definitely believe. I never heard that the lemnus gate is an elliptic curve. That's just well, me. I was I was I was unsure about that because of the fact that you know, the, the word lemnus gate had been used in so many different ways. You know, there are a whole bunch of different curves that are called the lemnus gate. And I right. thought maybe maybe this thing I have on the screen, maybe that was the lemnus gate that was related to elliptic curves, even though it's just a degenerate elliptic curve. But Stephen Kleiman says that, you know, Bernoulli's lemnus gate is this elliptic curve uh, and that it got the name lemnus gate because it looks like a figure eight. So I'm blaming Stephen Kleiman for, for forcing me into this position where I think that this complex conjugation anti-involution must fail to be a group homomorphism okay. or something like that. I mean, it, yes, it fails to be a group homomorphism, but I think it fails <laughs> just slightly. <laughs> well, I mean, it, it does have fixed points, right? Because the points on the figure eight are fixed points, right? right? So. Somehow that's not good enough to, right? That's, that's why I'm inclined to suspect that the answer to your, the question you asked me is no. That, you know, having this fixed point is not enough to make this anti-holomorphic thing. Oh, I see. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. But if you can clarify for this, me, that for, clarify all that for me, that would be great. But oh, I see, well, but one, of the reasons, one, of the reasons, one of the reasons my justification for real, well, I mean, you can tell. I mean, there's a lot of good reasons why the ones that, the ones where the complex conjugation anti-involution, the ones where those is a group involution, there's a lot of reasons why those are the good ones. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it's just obvious that those are the good ones, but I could give you more reasons why those are the good ones. Um, again, some I could give you some very highbrow reasons but perhaps also some lowbrow reasons why those are the good ones. Well, a, a, a sort of lowbrow re reason is, supposing you start out with one, even one of the peculiar ones, like Bernoulli's lemon escape, then, right, there's sort of a functor that passes from, to some extent, you can think of uh, taking the automorphism group of a curve as being functorial. We're used, you and I are used to this. You know, there, there are other ways in which it's not functorial, but it, it, for some purposes, at the level of groupoids, it's functorial. Um, mm -hmm. Taking the automorphism group is a functor. Mm -hmm. And taking the automorphism group of an elliptic curve, that's a lot like taking the translations. You know, not, right? I say, in this case, I mean the automorphism groups as an algebraic variety, mm -hmm. not as a group object. So the, yeah. the, the automorphisms of an algebraic as an algebraic variety, that's very close to being the translations. Yeah. And the translations automatically have a base point, the identity translation. Um, so there's this functorial process from, of passing from uh, you know, an elliptic curve, which possibly doesn't have a base point, to this elliptic curve that does automatically have a base point. Um, uh, by taking the translations. And um, yeah. so yeah. You, you, you subject, um, what am I trying to say? Uh, I mean, this is this functorial process. Right. So the right. You, 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 so this functorial process of passing to translations that should automatically act as an automatic improvement process on these uh, anti-involutions. Even if it started out not uh, being a group involution, it should end up being a group involution. So right. It's, it's, so it's not just that this moduli movie is a sub stack of the more general moduli stack. It's also a quotient stack of the more general moduli stack. So those, you know, those 
those other weird things are just extra weird variations that we don't have to worry about. So, um, so why is it a quotient stack? What do you mean by that? Because this process, this functorial process of passing to the translations, right? You start you start out with a you start out with an elliptic curve with an anti-involution, which is not a group involution. But by passing to the translations, you now have an elliptic curve, a complex elliptic curve with an anti-involution, which is a group involution because it you know it'll preserve this base point. It'll, pres it'll preserve the. Uh, uh -huh. The elliptic curve remains <laughs> isom. This improvement process, yeah, okay. So I, I'm being, yeah, I'm being very sketchy here. I'm, I'm leaving out some key things there, but, but yes, but it, I, th I think that this improvement process is going to work, and that uh -huh. it's going to, yeah, I'm being very sketchy there, but I think it's going to work. I think it's going to work. Okay. Well, anyway, it sounds like in the end you get like some way to take the figure eight and turn it into something better or something. Actually. I think that's right. I think that's right. But uh -huh. this, but this better thing, you know, is either going to be a Klein bottle with no points, or it's going to be an old fashioned. Uh, well, I, I mean, so, okay. So in the movie, time zero is actually, uh, this is like a Merbius strip version of the, uh, the Len escape. And exactly time in the middle, you know, uh, so, 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 so the time starts at negative pi, it goes up to positive pi. It's like going around a clock. So right in the middle, I'm trying to go right in the middle here. There's another, uh, you know, thing with square period lattice, but it is not Merbius. It's, you know, just an ordinary, non merbius ribbon. So you see what I'm saying? You're, you're right, you're supposed to imagine this, uh, you're supposed to imagine this, right? The bulk is like connecting the two, the two boundaries or in, in the Merbius case, it's connecting the one boundary to itself, the, the single boundary to itself. But this is connecting these two parts of the boundary to each other. So, right, I mean, okay, okay. I mean, th this, this animation is very primitive. Uh, you know, it's programmed by myself in a very sloppy way, but there should be all sorts, right? There should be very elaborate versions of this uh, movie. Uh, that show you all sorts of different things. So they would give you a hint about the complex thing that is connecting that, it, you know, so it, right, it's, what am I saying? It's cobordism or something like that, right? It's like a, Right, you think right. It's this whole idea. Think of a manifold with boundary as like a. You can think it's like a cobordism, but you can also think of it as a. Is this double of right? It's like, the, the double of a manifold with a boundary, and it's the orbit space of this involution on the double. Uh -huh. Yeah, I don't get what you. I guess I already lose it when you start talking about Mobius strip because that's like a manifold with boundary and I don't know where you're getting this Mobius strip from. All right, let me try, let me, let me, let me try to, let me try to draw something here. Uh, so let me try to go to, uh, well, okay, okay, okay. First of all, before I go to the drawing things here, let me go to, let me show you another version of this movie. Let me show you another version of this movie. So how do I get to this? Uh, Okay, uh, um, how does this work? Well, not sure I'm doing this right, but okay, let's try. Uh, real elliptic curves. Let me try this one. Okay. So, What is it doing? Let's ignore that thing at the, at the top. <laughs> um, okay. Okay. Uh, so, okay. 
This is the same movie, but just from a different viewpoint. Okay. So you see okay. those three points, you know, those are the roots of a cubic. Okay. And it's going like that, and it's you know it's taking a while. So let me zoom. Let me you know make it go a little bit faster. So at first I was annoyed by the way that 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 thing takes happens too quickly. Uh huh. Because, uh, you know, I, I couldn't tell which route was going to the left and which one was going to the right. <laughs> well, that doesn't make sense. Right. It took me a while to realize that it doesn't make sense because these uh -huh. routes are purely bosonic. They don't, you know, you can't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, and then it, let's see, so it keeps, keeps going. But you see how this is the same movie, sort of. And then, it, you know, and then it goes back like there. And, and then it's, it's back to where it started. So what I'm saying is that, you know, there's the one in the middle where they're perfectly horizontal and evenly spaced. Where is that? Uh -huh. It's like right there. Yeah. So that's right in the middle. Whereas the, so there, it's perfectly horizontal and evenly spaced. Whereas there's this vertical one where it's evenly spaced. And so those are both, right? Those are the same. Those are both the lemniscate. But one is Merbius and one of them is non Merbius. I don't know what this Merbius stuff is about. When you have a torus, right? We're taking a torus and we're folding it. And you can oh, fold yeah. it, you can fold it into a Merbius strip or you can fold it into a non Merbius strip. Meaning an annulus? Yeah, a cylinder, uh -huh. whatever you call it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I get what you're saying, at least, even though I don't. So this one here, right? This has four real branch points. How do I look at those three dots and see four real branch points? Uh, I, I mean, you know, because we're, we're taking the square root, you know, the, 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 the the roots of the polynomial, well, the roots and poles of the polynomial. So all the, so the, you know, there's also the point at infinity. Those are becoming the, you know, the branch points when you take the square root. So, okay. uh -huh. so this is a classic, you know, if you think about it, this is a classic square period lattice. And so is the one where the three points are vertically spaced uh, evenly, vertically evenly spaced. Uh -huh. but, but this one, we have folded the torus into a, what I was calling a cylinder, what you were calling an annulus. But if you do it the other way around, if you, you know, if you do it this way, if you think about it, you have folded it into a uh, into a Merbius strip. And it's good to understand. It's good to actually be able to visualize these. I'm not sure how well I can. Right, if I had better pictures, better versions of the movie, we could really see exactly how this is going. You'd, you'd be able to see the, the Merbius ribbon in this picture right here. And you'd be able to see the non-Merbius ribbon in the other picture, in the one in the middle. Yeah, I can't see why that's true, except that I can see here that like, in here complex conjugation is switching those two roots on top and bottom and then the other one that's fixing them. So, I mean, I know that has to do with it, but I don't know why that gives you a, a Mobius strip. Well, oh, okay, okay. Now, now maybe I will switch the screen sharing to, um, how do I do this? Uh, I'm gonna try sharing screen, but it's sharing a different screen this time. So I'm over here. All right, now do you see Something yet? Let's see. Do you see this yet? Yep. Okay. And um, so, <laughs> all right. Maybe I should try zooming a little bit more. Let's see. How does this work?
So let's see, what should I do? Maybe I should put the identity element right in the middle. And now we need an anti-involution that fixes that, um, that identity element. Okay. And I think there's just a few possibilities. Is that right? I mean, there's like using this as a mirror. Mm -hmm. But let's see, does that also fix all these points? Let's see, I'm confused. <laughs> is, that, is that really true? Let's see. Doesn't, I don't think so. It doesn't map them over to the ones you're about to draw now, which are different. Okay, maybe I do it in the wrong place. Maybe it's maybe it just mean that it's over here, the, that the boundary. Yeah, that would fix those points. <clears throat> so those are all fixed points. So I think this one looks like, right? Look at that. That's a cylinder. Okay, I believe you. But if we do it the other way, Like that, then is there anything that's fixed other than these? Or and can you see that this is giving a Merbius thing? Let's see. What am I trying to say? Uh, when you reflect, um, when you reflect in this way, are you getting a Merbius strip? So it looks like nothing is fixed except for those. And so you're getting right. So right. So we so you know we have some sort of surface which has a boundary, which is a single yeah. circle. So it's either a disk <laughs> or a movie strip. But it, it it's it's obviously a movie strip because it's anti. It's you know, non orientable. What, no, what am I saying? There? What am I trying to say? I think, <laughs> ah, okay, I'm doing double job of thing. But yeah, I think, it, I think it sort of has to be a Merbius strip because of the anti holomorphic nature of the, you know, so I think, yeah, I think we're getting right. like a conformal Merbius strip here. Yeah. Oh, you should be able to take like a little letter R. Sorry, how did that, how did that, oh, say that again, what? You should be able to take a little letter like R, yeah. move it around on there, get it to come around back to itself reflected. You know, like the usual thing of like you have a little guy walking around and he comes back mirror imaged. So. As it sounds like you're giving the argument for, yeah, for why that's true, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I guess I see it. Yeah, so like if I let a little R, yeah, it's a little R the there. Yes. I feel like move it. it's going to look like there or something like that. Yeah, and if it goes up, yeah, if it goes, up, you know, crosses the boundary up or to the left or something like that, it's going to come back and meet its uh -huh. reverse doppelganger. Yep. Okay. So I get it now. Mm -hmm. Um. Well, I, I mean, I get this. I don't. I yeah. Guess I don't get why the maybe I do. Those roots having those positions, like all on a vertical line or all on a horizontal line, corresponds to this. Maybe I don't. I don't know if I care about that <laughs> anymore. I, I, like I, I mean, I mean, it, you know, the whole qualitative thing is determined by whether you've got real roots or matched pairs of complex roots. Um, you know, by these arguments that we're kind of giving here. <laughs> I mean, I'm being very sloppy, but it's, it, it, if you think about it, 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 it really does work. Um, that, um, yeah, okay. I mean, right, you have, to, you're right, you have to be good at performing the visual transformation between the picture of the, the roots on the Riemann sphere, right? The, 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 
those three vertical roots, those are living on the Riemann sphere. Right. And the, and, and the point at infinity is the fourth one. Yeah. And, um, but, but, but now my picture um, that I think is on the screen at the moment, I think that's visible to you at the moment, with the red and black and stuff like that, um, yeah. that is on the double cover. This, you know, right? We, we, have, we have this, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, this doubly periodic thing, yeah, that covers this, yeah. Um, so, Yes. What was I trying to say? Yeah, right. I mean, if if you have if you're if you have complete mastery of that, of how to switch it back and forth between the single cover picture and the double cover picture, then everything is straightforward. Mm -hmm. Everything what I'm saying should be straightforward. You should be able to see how you know th this. Okay, well. Yeah, so the three vertical dots corresponds to this thing with the diagonal mirror that gives you a Mervius thing. And, uh, you know, it, 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 it has to do with the fact that there's this matched pair of imaginary roots. And, you know, so. Right, you have to think about how that boundary forms a group. Right. So, uh, right. I mean, so, so we're saying that the, we're saying that the real points in this case as a group, remember, this is the good, we're thinking about the good case where it really is a group. The real, real points are a group. And yeah. it, in, in that case, you know, the, these points that we're looking at are the points of order two. So, right. You can see that in some cases, it's just the circle group. In other cases, it's the circle cross Z mod two. And when it's a circle cross Z mod two, how many two torsion points on it have, does it have? It has four, so that's four real roots. But when it's just a, 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 a single circle, just a single component boundary, there's only two, two torsion points on it. So that means, right? So that's, that's what we're dealing with. We're dealing, we're dealing with the case where there's uh, a, pair of imaginary, match pair of imaginary roots where, versus the case where there's all three real roots and you're oscillating back and forth between those two cases. So it's, you know, the, the whole movie is going back and forth. You know, so the droplet, when, the, when, when there's a droplet existing, that's a, uh, you know, a all four, uh, all four two torsion points are real. In fact, let's go back to that movie for a second, okay? Uh, where, where the hell was that? Why can't I see this? Oh, it's up there. Is that right? Okay, so it should be over here. Is that right? Okay, there it is. And um, I don't see any, you're just sharing. I just <laughs> see the same thing. Right, right. So I have to do. I kind of have to do the switching of the screen sharing here. So how do I do this? Um, where's the screen sharing? Here? I can't even see it. She's family. Oh, it's up there. Okay, stop sharing, and now start the other sharing. So it's screen one. Is that right? Okay, now you can see the movie? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So yeah, I mean, you know, let me go back to there. The droplet is forming and then pretty soon it's gonna break off. Um, so uh, the, think about where the two torsion points are here, right? So, right, it's the horizontal tangents are the two torsion points, right? When you, right, it's a cubic uh, and you have a, a straight line through the cubic, it, it, it gives you three points that add up to zero. That's how the, you know, the geometric rule for the multiplication structure on, a, on this cubic works. Uh, that's why it's in a 
group. So uh, the horizontal tangents are the, are, are the straight lines where, that go through infinity. Uh -huh. um, they go through infinity and they have, you know, so that leaves the other point, the, the point where it's tangent, that means that, you know, x plus x plus zero is equal to zero. So those are the two torsion points. So you can see that there are four two torsion points here. When right when the when the droplet has broken off, so that must mean that you know the bound right right. I mean the boundary is in two separate sections, right? Okay, so I mean it's a uh huh. Yeah, okay, it's yeah. It's for anyone watching this, the fourth horizontal point is the one at infinity, so that's, that's why right. we don't see. Yeah, you you're saying you see these four points. Yeah. Yeah. Right, that's yeah. right. You uh, see that's right. right. Yeah. Whereas here we only see two of them, so you know the 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 topological group is just the circle group. And it's the boundary of this, uh, you know, folded thing. And so it must be, you know, a Mobius strip with just a single circle boundary and et cetera, et cetera. You do have to stare at these things and visualize them and think about the visualization a lot to really get really familiar with it. And I'm not, I'm not really familiar with that. I'm just struggling. I'm just a little bit ahead of you. I'm struggling with this. So, um, so, uh, so we're, we're, um, so, so, yeah, so notice that, right? I mean, things that appear as a single point in the complex, well, some things, some things in the, complex moduli stack don't appear at all, right? Because there's, there are just a lot of complex elliptic curves that don't have an anti-involution at all, because, right, you, you, you need the, you know, the parallelogram basically has to be a diamond uh -huh. or a rectangle in order to have an, the right kind of anti-involution. Uh -huh. um, so, so you were doing a rectangle. You were doing a case that was both, right? The square. That's right. That's that one case. Is that why you get these two different kind of uh, cases? One where you had this diagonal line that you, in your previous picture, and one where you had this vertical line. Two different types of involutions. Yes. Yes. So but normally you just get normally. For a generic <laughs> curve with an involution, you just you wouldn't get such fancy behavior. No, it's actually well, uh, it's actually weird. What am I trying to say? So, uh, oh. right, think of the moduli stack of complex elliptic curves, and think of it as right. It's related to this Cocksetter group. Uh, what is it? PGL two. Z uh -huh. is, is this Cocksetter group, um, a hyperbolic Cocksetter group that we've been fooling around with recently, semi recently. And, um, but when you completely fold it up, right, you just get, right, the, the completely folded up modular curve. Well, completely folded up, I mean, it's. <laughs> right, PGL has one more. Uh, PSL is indexed to in, in PGL or something like that. So what am I trying to say that? Uh... <laughs> so many things I'm so many things I'm trying to explain here and, and, and it's so hard to figure out how to explain. Let's see. So Right, you pick you you picture an arbitrary modular curve as a branched cover of this thing. What is it called? The upper half plane, or something like that. Um, the you know it's often called the moduli stack of elliptic curves. And then when you add more structure to the elliptic curve, you get some more unwrapped modular curves. And if you completely unwrap it, then you get this, you know, this cocksetter thing. 
Uh-huh. So what am I trying to say? What am I trying to say? That I mean, there's this Coxeter tiling, right? The famous Escher Coxeter tiling in the hyperbolic plane. Yep. I mean, there's a whole bunch of them, but there's the one particular one that we associate with the Coxeter group for, you know, for PGL2Z, or the Coxeter, the Coxeter reflection group is PGL2Z. The associated Coxeter rotation group is PSL2, common Z. Yep. And, um, you know, completely folded up, except that you don't do the last folding that would make it non-orientable. Um, but aside from that, it's completely folded up and that gives you the moduli stack of elliptic curves with no extra structure, basically. And um, all those things on the boundary, I mean, what, what, am, I, what am I trying to say? The, right, the cocks of the tiling consists of interiors of tiles and boundaries of tiles. And it's all of those boundaries of tiles where all these rectangles and diamonds live. So, yeah, so, so we're really getting this. Right, so you've, you've got the Riemann sphere and it's got this equator on it that has like, Right, if you do it with respect to the, the J function, you've got, if I remember correctly, the zero function is the square period lattice. The, the, the zero value of the J function, J equals zero is the square period lattice. J equals one is where you have the equilateral triangle period lattice. And J equals infinity is the degenerate one that's like a cusp or something like that. Uh -huh. So, I mean, this circle that we're getting, it is just the, that circle that's on the Riemann sphere, and, and right, and, and, and this Riemann sphere is the thing that all the modular curves are unwrappings of, and they are branched at zero, one, and infinity. No, I didn't get that last part, about the circle on the Riemann sphere being something well, you know, it's like with ch ch children's drawings that they are these things that are branched at zero, one, and infinity. And you can think of, in this context, you can think of zero as being the Gaussian square period lattice, one as being the Eisensteinian equilateral triangle period lattice, and infinity is the cusp, you know, which doesn't, it's like the degenerate elliptic curve is not really a period lattice. Um, and you know the whole moduli stack. Well, right. I mean, modular curves are like branched covers of that. Yeah, I sometimes call it coverings, unwrappings. Um, so branched covers of that. Uh, So, 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 so first of all, I'm saying that for these real elliptic curves, you stay away from the interior of the tiles. You're only at the boundaries of the tiles. Uh -huh. But also, all these boundaries of the tiles are just, you know, it's, it's like, it's like, it's, it's right, it's just the boundary of a single triangle, right? These triangular tiles, hyperbolic triangular tiles, you, you just have one single one of them. I mean, I, I guess you have two of them that are they're mirror reflections of each other. But, but the boundary, you just have one single boundary between them. And that is this equator on this Riemann sphere. And it's, you know, it got zero and one infinity. Uh-huh. Yeah, I sort of get it, yeah. Uh -huh. Right, okay, okay. So, so what I'm saying is this. What I'm saying is, if you consider realness of an elliptic curve as being a property, then you're just getting the equator on that Riemann sphere. But you can also consider realness as a structure because you can have different non-equivalent anti-involutions. And for that, you're getting this double cover of the equator. Except it's, <laughs> sorry, is it a double cover of the equator? It's actually doing something strange. Let me see if I can draw a picture of what it's doing here. Uh, so am I back to the, <laughs> okay, now I have to, I have to switch back to the other screen sharing here. So I'm back here. 
and I'm back to, I gotta get better at this switching. I'm back to there. Okay. Oh. Okay. And I'm trying to draw these pictures again. So what am I trying to say that, um, yeah, <laughs> let, me, let me try to draw the picture here. Uh, All right, all right, all right. Let me try to draw this. So, it's something. Let, let's 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 see if we can remember what the picture looked like. It started out with what three vertical, and then and then it's something like uh, well, and, and at the opposite one there. Am I saying that right? Let's see. It goes here to the middle. Yeah, to the middle, it goes like that. And so how does it accomplish this? It, um, you know, it has to move the, the middle one out of the way or something like that. So it's like, right, the cusp one is like something like, that I think. So in between here and here is the ones where it's like that. And then over here, it's like this. And mm -hmm. over, <laughs> what is it doing? Let's see. Uh, See, I think it's gonna be something like this. There are these matched, uh, th these are the two different, right? So what, what I'm saying is that for a diamond, you can have that anti-involution or that anti-involution. Yeah, I figured that, that out like about three minutes ago, suddenly and with rectangle, you also have two, yeah. And for a rectangle, you have two like that. And that corresponds to like this and, and you know, it's like this one and this one, or this one and this one, this one. And this one. Uh -huh. But the square period lattice is very weird. It's, you know, it's got this extra stackiness or something. And, and mm -hmm. it's yeah. so, so like, right. Yeah, I get it. So, yeah. So, uh, so it's like, uh -huh. it's like there's this equator where, where every point is getting covered twice, but we're not doing it just by going like that. It's more like we're, you know, we're starting at the, the Gaussian is like zero and the Eisenstein is one and the cusp is infinity. And we're sort of going, what are we doing? We're starting at zero and then we're going to infinity and then I'm not sure, I, I forget, but we're doubling back somehow. It's, it's like folding rather than covering. It's folding rather than wrapping. You know, it's wrapping with these funny folds in it or something like that. Huh. So uh, again, when you really understand this, which I'm struggling with at the moment, but when you really understand this in a visual, visual way, you can see how that all this is fitting together. So, um, so, 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 I mean, okay, so th th here we're giving a very lowbrow perspective on why, you know, realness is not just a property, it's a structure, because you can have different anti-involutions, you know, that give you like either, so, so most of them come like in a Merbius form and a non-Merbius form. Um, and those are the two different flavors of uh, anti-involution on it. Um, I think that's even true with the Gaussian one, but it's just it's just funny that the you know the, the pair the, the way they pair up is they pair up like this, except that this one pairs up with this one. 
Um, so, so like, yeah, so this here is like a stackiness rather than a, I think it's a stackiness rather than pairing up two of them. But, it, but, but meanwhile, this one is, right? I mean, the Gaussian is the one that has both the diamond aspect and the right. rectangle aspect. So it's weird and you have to visually grok it to really see what's going on. But um, see, <laughs> there's also a very nice highbrow perspective on why the moduli stack of real elliptic curves, you know, it, it only gives you, it only gives you the diamonds and rectangles, but those it covers twice in this funny way, in this funny folded way. And um, so, right, you, 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 have to, you have to remember what the theory is like. It's the theory of a line object, right? If you try to just say, if, right, the highbrow perspective is that you can describe this moduli stack of elliptic curves from a very nice doctrinaire way, doctrine related way, with the as the you know the moduli stack of models of a theory, and the theory is something like the theory of a line object, and it has sections in grades four and six, and then there's some extra stuff that you can put in to rule out very degenerate cases, very irrelevant degenerate cases. But but the point is, when you do this more morally correctly, you're putting generators in grades four and six. I mean, some people say you know some people calibrate it so that you're in grades two and three or something. But 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 part of the point is that there really are these you know either half integer grades, or if you calibrate it differently, then there are these odd grades. And that affects the theory, right? Because in other words, that means that each model of the theory actually has an extra involution to it. So actually the whole, every point of the, of the theory is stacked. And that corresponds to the fact that every elliptic curve has one involution. I mean, some of them have more than one involution, but everyone has one involution given by taking the negative. Mm -hmm. So when you, create the moduli stack in the correct way. You're actually making these things into, you know, a being group. You're making this line object into the universal cover of the, uh, of, of the elliptic curve. And- um, You need a relation in grade 12 too? I don't think so. Uh, if you do that, you're cutting down to just the degenerate ones, the cusp ones, or something like that. Um, this oh, is I actually got confused. Right. Yeah, this is right. I mean, you actually get this interesting algebra that just is free on one thing in generator, in one thing in grade four, and one thing in grade six. And you know, it, the, the dimensions of the grades are going up. This is the algebra of modular forms, the great algebra of modular forms, uh, the great algebra of cusp forms. Oh, I, see. I think is when you yeah, put in that right. grade 12 relation up there. So it just lives on the cusps, on the degenerate ones or something like that. I hope I'm not getting that too badly screwed up. So, yeah. Yeah. so what I'm saying is you can take this theory and you can take its real points in the sense of homming that two rig into the two rig of real vector spaces. Instead of homming into the two rig of real vector of complex vector spaces where you would get the models to be complex elliptic curves, you can hom it into the two rig of real vector spaces. And from this highbrow point of view, it will automatically give you this double cover of the moduli space. So it'll act, it will automatically make the, the um, you know, extra structure, not just the property of being a real elliptic curve, but the structure of being a real elliptic curve, it will handle it in this nice highbrow way, which will coincide with this more lowbrow way of thinking about the extra structure that, you know, there are these multiple involutions, you know, like with the diamond, you can have the two struts of a kite being too different to anti-involutions, mm -hmm. uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, so we're actually in a funny folded way, we're double covering the, 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 the these sort of bilaterally symmetric 
complex elliptic curves, the diamonds and the uh, re rectangles. You know, each, each, pretty much each one is showing up in a Merbius form and a non-Merbius form, I think. <laughs> it's something like that. And um, at least some of them form, show up in both a Merbius form and a non-Merbius form, at least the rectangle curves. No, maybe it's that. <laughs> ah, I'm not. Actually, I think it's the diamonds are the Merbius things and the rectangles are the non merbius yeah. It's something like that. I'm yeah, sorry. that sounds right. And then we were talking mostly about the square where you have both. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, right, maybe it's only, right. Maybe it's only the square period lattice that shows up in both Merbius and non merbius form. But don't trust me on that. I mean, you have to really share the pictures and see what's going on. But, um, yeah, so, so the point is, if you think of it from the, from the point of the J function, uh, you know, in, if, right, if you calibrate the frames of this movie by the J function, then, you know, they're, they're showing, each J value is showing up twice. And um, so now what's the point of this? The point of this, I mean, there's all sorts of points to this, but what's the alleged point that I'm supposed to be talking about today? So, uh, I wish I could see the clock so I could see how badly I'm running out on. Why can't you I see You have the clock? talked for an hour and 15 minutes. Okay. Um, so uh, the. One new way you can describe the Higner numbers is this. So from a imaginary quadratic number ring, or let's say imaginary quadratic number field, whatever. You can get an elliptic curve, an elliptic curve with complex multiplication. Mm -hmm. And basically you're just taking the algebraic integers in this imaginary quadratic number field to be the period lattice. I mean, there's other little variations you can play, but those, that's the main th thing that you're doing here. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you're taking all the algebraic integers in your imaginary quadratic number field, and that's becoming your period lattice. And you can take, you know, so, so, so that's a thing that you can evaluate the J function at. That's a thing that you can evaluate the J function at. Yep. And you can do, so you can do that, right. You can do that to any imaginary quadratic number field. And I think you'll always get an algebraic number, but you'll rarely get a rational. And the times you get a rational number are, the times you get a rational number are the Higner numbers. The, 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 these Higner imaginary quadratic number rings, which are giving these you know, elliptic curves with complex multiplication, but very special ones. And so if, 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 if I'm not too badly confused, those, well, so you, right, you, you, you can take any elliptic curve and you can ask whether the J function evaluated at this complex elliptic curve gives you a rational number. And if it does, that's called a rational elliptic curve. And it's equivalent to, you know, being in some sense defined over the rational numbers. Again, I hope I'm not making too many horrible mistakes. Here. So those rational elliptic curves, those are the subject of a sort of famous theorem called the modularity theorem, which used to be called something like the Tanayama Bay conjecture or something like that. So, you know, the modularity theorem says mm -hmm. that uh, only tries to guarantee that those things with the rational J values, the Higner, well, not, sorry, <laughs> did I say that? Right, uh, but right. Uh, only those elliptic curves with the rational J values are modular curves. So uh, uh, what I'm saying, what I'm saying is here, I'm saying that there's an overlap, but there's, there's a kind of overlap between two big programs to understand elliptic curves. 
one of these big programs sort of culminated in the modularity theory. And, you know, that proved Fermat's last theorem and things like that. And it's a big part of the Langlands program. So it's a very Langlands approach to understanding elliptic curves. And more generally, it will actually, you know, cover a billion varieties and everything like that. So the modularity theorem. So there's something like, you know, it's probably, <laughs> how much fine print is there in that? I don't know. But it says something like every rational elliptic curve is a modular elliptic curve. This is, every rational elliptic curve is a modular curve or something like that. I mean, mm -hmm. people do put lots, lots of fine print into what we mean by a modular curve, but I'm not sure that as, I'm not sure the fine print is as annoying as they make it sound. Um, so, but roughly speaking, that's the idea. So, so the Langlands program is a big program. It's so big that it applies way beyond all of this, but it does apply to elliptic curves in a way. And in, in, in one of the ways it applies to elliptic curves is that it sort of becomes or manifests as the modularity theorem, which says that any rational elliptic curve, anytime you have this rational J invariant for any abelian, um, any, any elliptic curve, even if it doesn't come from an imaginary quadratic number field, you will get a uh, elliptic curve which secretly is a modular curve in some sense, or you know, maybe there's fine printing what they mean by a modular curve there. Sometimes they say it's covered, I, I, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not gonna worry about that right now. But, but these rational elliptic curves, whatever it is that the modular theorem says, it says them about these rational elliptic curves. Yeah, I, I ran a follow of that once. Yes. And, I, and was told that a rational, sorry, a modular elliptic curve is not, a modular curve <laughs> uh, because of some of these fine print. Issues. I don't think the fine print is as bad as they say, but I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure. Um, uh, so how did you, but, but you sort of tried to weasel out it by talking about <laughs> elliptic modular curves and saying that they're not necessarily modular curves. Uh, no, I was, I, I yeah. was accidentally thinking that elliptic modular was the conjunction of the adjectives elliptic and modular. Yeah, yes, but the, but the resolution of that confusion is to say that it's not just a conjunction, it's just a, right. yeah. it's the, a unified it's the word <laughs> with <Yeah>. multiple <laughs> syllables. Right, um, yeah. So, so anyway, yeah. yeah. So yeah. I, I don't understand, <laughs> I think I understood it back then, even though I was screwing up than I do now, but anyway, okay. So okay. what's the other, so that's one big. The other big pro program to, to me, it seems big is understanding uh, abelian varieties by a complex multiplication. And basically the, the Eugentraum and all of the descendants of the Eugentraum, which I guess probably does include the Alpha's Traum, but I'm not gonna worry about that right now. Um, so yeah. Is this is there big, some yeah? Uh, is there some easy way to say a generalization of the Eugentraum to abelian varieties? Like, what plays the role of the J function for this generalized version, or is that not how you? State well, I, 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 I'm not sure you should think of the J function as being the key thing, even in the elliptic curve. Okay. I mean, it's, you know, the J function is a modular function, but the elliptic functions are in a way even more important than the modular functions. So it's, it's really the, the, well, I mean, there are elliptic functions and then there are modular functions and then there are sort of combination of the two, maybe you call them elliptical modular <laughs> functions. When you're doing abelian varieties, you have abelian functions that live on the abelian varieties. You have the abelian modular functions that live on the moduli stack of abelian varieties. And then you have some mixture of them you know, abelian or modular functions or something like that. So, and all of these play a role in the, um, in the, all, all of these play a, a, a role in the generalized Eugentraum. The, roughly speaking, the thing that plays the role of the imaginary quadratic number fields when you start getting into higher dimensional abelian varieties is, well, perhaps it should be the, maybe they're called the totally imaginary number fields or something like that. Um, they're kind of generalization of the imaginary uh -huh. uh, 
number fields or something like that. And um, imaginary quadratic number fields or something like that. And um, so they give you abelian varieties and then well, somehow so, you so, can so what, do what something they do, to those abelian varieties and get yes, I mean, numbers. I, 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 yeah, I, I mean, there is this idea that you can, you know, think of various elliptic functions, modular functions as sort of machines that turn ideals into ideal numbers. I do like that viewpoint of thinking about it, but I don't think that's really the most sophisticated way of thinking about it. I mean, more what you mean by sophisticated. Um, I think of the Eugentraum as a way of making the art and reciprocity theorem into something very explicit, making the art and reciprocity theorem more explicit in cases where you can do it. And you may be able to do some, if you generalize it far enough, you know, including the Altus term, you may be able to make the whole art and reciprocity theorem more explicit. And the, and the whole art and reciprocity theorem is telling you all about how to understand abelian extensions of a number field in a nice Galois theoretic way. So, I mean, the Langmans program is supposed to go far beyond that because it's supposed to go far beyond the abelian extensions, uh, far beyond the abelianization of the Galois. But so I've always been very interested in trying to understand the relationship between the generalized Eugentraum ideas and the Langlands program ideas. And I used to get very frustrated because whenever I used to try to learn something about this, you know, I would naively read papers dealing with the proof of the actual proof of Fermat's last theorem. And they would always start out saying something like, let X be a, an elliptic curve without complex multiplication. Because, you know, apparently they had, you know, I, 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 was, uh -huh. interested, I was interested in the overlap case. And the, the Higner case, the Higner numbers sort of tell you the overlap between the elliptic curves that can be understood by, by uh -huh. complex multiplication and the elliptic curves that can be understood by the modularity theorem, okay. by the Tanayama of A conjecture. And I mean, this has to do with the fact that, what am I trying to say that, right? Part of, part of the naive story here is that, well, rational numbers are real numbers, right? I mean, in, from, from, from a certain point of view, it's the rational values of the J function that are, equal, that are important. But for understanding this, I would really like to picture the real values of the J function. And I also like to picture the whole Moduli stack of the real elliptic. So what I'm saying is that in this movie that we're trying to understand, there are certain very special frames that we want to highlight. We want to highlight certain very special frames in this movie. And I was, again, my program, my coding is so primitive, I've barely gotten these programs to work yet. But I, I'd really like to get the programs to work better so you can, you know, Right, for, for one thing, they're supposed to like, I, I showed you two different versions of the movie, but they, it should be like, you know, those two versions should be blended together and you should be able to sort of see them together or something like that. Uh-huh. Um, and uh, uh, so one of the things that we really, really want to do is we want to have the movie display when we reach the special frames that are the Hegner frames. Um, so what are the Higner numbers? One, two, three, seven, 11, 19, 43, 67, and 163, I think. And, well, the first, the first two of those are kind of weird. There's one and, okay, let me try to get another program here. That, Again, all these programs should be incorporated together, but I'm not very good at coding. So uh, I'm trying to show you something here. Let's see. Let me try this. No, that's not it. Let me try another one. Uh, We're going to have to reshare your screen when you get the, the right one. Okay. Uh, de, de share and reshare. 
Okay, okay, yeah. Okay, so let, let, let me try to get the right one here. But um, uh, okay, three, two, three, two, three, three, three. That's not it. Oh, okay, okay. I think I know which one now. I have this one. Okay, and then it should be it should be over here somewhere. It should only take me not. I mean, it's very inefficient. I know, I know I'm very inefficient with this, but it shouldn't be that bad. Give me a... Uh, should be here. Okay, there it is. Okay, now I'm trying to switch the screen sharing. So how do I do that? Uh, here's the thing there, stop sharing. Switch the screen sharing. Screen one. And share. And what was it you wanted? Control plus or something? Sure. Yeah. That's just the thing that makes text bigger. Yep. Is that working? Not Didn't work yet. this time? No. <laughs> Not yet. Why isn't it working? Know. I don't know. Control. Oh, okay. Maybe I was doing it. I think you have to click on the window that you're attempting to affect. All right. Well, well, let me try. Control. I don't, I didn't sense you clicking on the window that you were trying to play. Yeah. Now you somehow did something. There it goes. Now it's doing it. Yep. Okay. Ah. <laughs> okay. Okay. So there are the Hegner numbers there. Yep. And you can see that when I trust Mathematica to calculate the J function, which they call Klein invariant J, and I, I apply it to these. You know these these generating algebraic numbers of the imaginary quadratic number fields. You can see you can see that it's give, it's actually giving you rational values of the of the J invariant there. Uh, except in one case, I mean, the, right? I mean, so I, I, there's also right there's all sorts of mystical arithmetic patterns to this that I don't really understand. But do you see all that? It says one twenty five over sixty four. Those are like cube numbers and 512 over 27. Those are cube numbers. 512 uh -huh. is a cube number. Why does it start by saying Klein invariant one plus i over two? Well, it's because the first two Higner numbers are peculiar. Um, okay, it's, yeah. it's, it's the ones beyond that are all right. equal to three mod four. Right, I was just about to say that. <laughs> so just, yeah, so uh -huh. okay. So, so, the, so the first one, of course, yeah. You know, so all they, they are all diamond shaped ones, uh, and and that's why you know you have to take the average of one and the. Mm -hmm. you, I did that thing where I took the mean of one and the square root of negative the Higner number, um, and that's because you've got a diamond shaped parallelogram, and. Um, so you shouldn't do it for those first two. You yeah, you have to. Just, you have to do. You have to do something different for those first two. Like you should use square root of negative two. It's supposed to be an algebraic integer. Yeah. It's, so. Yes. Yes. But I uh, are you trying to tell me because I couldn't get two to work at all. I got one to work by just putting in you know the square root of negative one, and that, and that gave me the okay. right. That gave me the Klein in in. in that would give you the, the J value one, which like right. it, as it's supposed to. Yeah. But uh, I, you know, I, I worked for <laughs> a long time trying to get two to work, and I couldn't get any of my guesses to work. So I don't know. It, maybe your guess is correct for what the what two is, but I'm not going to worry about that right now. I'm not going to worry about that right now. Okay. Um. So. Uh, so. So. But I wish I could. I wish I could figure out what, what, how to do it for 
two as well as for all the other Higner numbers. Are those, those big, are those big numbers negative cubes? Negative I, perfect cubes? I think so. I'm going by vague memory of the last time I understood this. Um, You've got this little chunk about abelian surface covering up the last few digits of the biggest one of the that one there. Okay, yeah, that's more that's promising. Three zeros looks good. <laughs> yeah, but I yes, don't know. Yes, what yes. That, what that's the cube of, but uh huh. Cool. Yeah, I, I have a feeling I used to know, and I used to, you know, understand something about the mis the number mysticism here, but um, but at the moment I'm, you know, struggling with it. Um, but right, if we could understand what's going on in these Higner theme, Higner cases, right? My vague idea is that you know this is like the mystical nexus between the Langlands program and the Yugen trip. The generalized, uh -huh. and um, uh, but then I make it clear that you know when I try to read the you try to, uh, you know my night my old naive attempts to read papers proving uh -huh. the, the the Fermat's last theorem it always foundered on the the fact that the the Fermat's last theorem people always started out by saying ignore the case that Tim Dolan <laughs> is interested in. Um, you know, it's I always too, try to, it's too easy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I wanted to so somehow I'm not going to tell you about it. Right. I wanted to somehow see how what they're doing in the language uh -huh. program is a generalization right, yeah. of uh -huh. stuff that's going on in the unit. But it's but it's or yeah, is there some is sure. there some common generalization? If there's some push out of the language program and the uh I mean I and I think there I think there are a bunch of people who know all that how to think about it. But I, I can't, you know, I can't understand what they're saying, so I have to struggle with this. Uh -huh. um, so um, that's kind of the naive plan here. Okay, that's the naive plan. Here. The the naive. You have plan. some picture like you have some picture like the. So you're like showing me the circle picture with these horizontal lines in it that were supposed to be like the the circular movie that you were talking about. The looping points on the looping movie. Yes. And so there should be like certain points on there that are the Higner. Exactly. Points. Exactly. The Higner frames. The Higner frames. The Higner. Uh, yeah. The Higner times in this, in this movie. Uh, yes. And I didn't get. I, I, I was struggling with that. I, I just have you know all sorts of different parameterizations. I'm struggling with uh, getting it to work. But yes. I'm, I'm trying to see this. I'm trying to get the program to display this in sort of movie form, you know, so that you can. Uh -huh. And uh, okay, now let me let me see if I can uh, turn this right. Uh, let me go back to this one. I mean, it'd be great if there was something that looked that you could make look different about the Higner ones, but it would need to be. Uh, something very number theoretic, something about rational numbers, I guess. Yes. Well, so one of the things that we want to do is we want to display the torsion points on these um, elliptic curves. So, uh, let, uh, yeah. Let me just uh, let me just go slightly. Ah, okay. I, I want it to be two separate ones. Okay, there it is. Uh, I think we mentioned this before. You can see where the two torsion points are, right? Yep. Yep. Okay. <clears throat> and then let's when see. When you said torsion points just now, did you mean other torsion points also? You said you want us to see the torsion points. Right, right. I mean, I, I mean, it's it's really easy to see the torsion, two torsion points. It may right. also be easy to see. It may be somewhat easy to see the three torsion points. Let, let, let me just see if I can. Uh... So, does it make sense? I was guessing that the inflection points are the three torsion points because, right? I mean, does this make any sense that you know if you're taking uh, 
right? I mean, the, the, the straight line through the cubic gives you a plus b plus c equals zero. But if, but if all those three points are coinciding, then it's a plus a plus a equals zero. Oh. And, and, and that would be a, a three torsion point hmm. on the cubic. And I'm hoping that the interpretation of that is that it's just a, an inflection point. I mean, that made me over optimistic that I could get, you know, the five torsion points to be the, <laughs> you know, the higher five inflection, the fifth degree inflection points, but that doesn't, I'm pretty sure that doesn't make any sense. But, um, but at least it's true. Right, I mean, right, there is these, there are these geometric methods by drawing straight lines through the cubic of understanding, in principle, the addition or multiplication operation on this real elliptic mm -hmm. curve. Um, and um, I, I thought about that, you know, how, how complicated is the picture gonna get if I try to draw all the auxiliary lines that I need in order <laughs> to see the five torsion points or the 17 torsion points on this elliptic curve. I don't know, but that, but, but but in principle, that's very important in understanding the, uh -huh. um, the Jugendtraum or the modularity theorem for this um, for this uh, for this for uh, for these Hegner elliptic curves, these special Hegner elliptic curves. So. Also, right, I mean, so one of the things that's going on here, right, is that, right, we're saying that each, each elliptic curve appears twice, I think, in the, uh, in the moduli movie. You know, as a, oh. as a co complex elliptic curve, it appears twice in the real movie. And, um, you know, each diamond or each rectangle or whatever. And, You know, right? I, I mean, if you put together the torsion points on the one real form with the torsion points on the other real form, then I think you're getting something that's sort of like almost the whole lattice of torsion points for the whole complex elliptic curve. So, right, part of my part of my plan here is that we should actually this this you know putting these real structures on these mm heating -hmm. or elliptic curves. Mm -hmm should actually be useful from the point of view of organizing the torsion points into a mixture of real, real torsion points and imaginary torsion points or something like that. Um, uh -huh. Uh -huh. And, and, and that this should, you know, you know, there's the whole Galois theoretic aspect of the torsion points, right? I mean, the torsion points are a very Galois theoretic thing. You're supposed to understand how the Galois action on the coordinates of the torsion points matches up especially when you're understanding the Eugentraum, you're understanding how that matches up to the arithmetic and the Galois theory of the imaginary quadratic number field. So um, that's, that's kind of what we're trying to do here. So that's part of the plan. So that's part of the plan. Now I have about 15 minutes left. So let me try to tell you further ridiculous, grandiose attempts to do stuff here. But I, I hope I've already sort of told you the plan. The plan is, you know, just that the whole, the plan is that the Hegner numbers embody this potential conceptual overlap between the Jugendtraum and the Langmans curve. And, um, you know, by actually staring at these things and doing explicit calculations with them and understanding them in detail and incorporating this into or joining this, marrying this to uh, the project that you and I have to understand the being varieties in general. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the, the goal is to learn whatever we can from this. The goal is to learn whatever we can from this. So for, I mean, for example, right? Remember one of the things we ran into was 
you know, in our, for, in our general study of abelian varieties, we made a lot of progress in understanding the neuron severity group. Mm -hmm. But then we sort of, I at least got confused about these generic cases versus these special cases. And in these special cases, I could get a very nice picture of what was going on. But then in the more generic cases, I got very confused. I still want to, you know, work that out very explicitly. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, all of that stuff should tie in what, with what we're doing here now in terms of understanding the trying to understand, struggling to understand the the Jugendtraum and the Langlands program and their overlap in the context of these Hegner modular curves. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, so what am I trying to say here? So yeah, I've got about 10 or 15 minutes left here. So mostly what I'm gonna to try to do in this last 10 or 15 minutes is tell you about a book that I've been reading on and off for a decade or a few decades. Uh, and I've been looking at it again recently. But, I, but, I, but I, you know, when I first started creating this, this, this movie program, uh, I was really trying to understand the stuff. And so, so the name of the book, it's called The Eightfold Way. Have you ever taken a look at this book, The Eightfold Way? Um, is it by someone named Sylvia or something like that? I think that? so, that's right. Sylvia Levy? Sylvia Levy. Sylvia well, Levy. it might be yeah. like, you know, it might be like, yeah. it's the ed editor or something like that. Right, yeah. Yeah, I was definitely reading it when I was trying to understand Klein's cortic curve, and most of it went over my head, but there was like some basic stuff that was really good about that. There's some really interesting stuff there. Well, I, I, I'll, I, I'm also sort of interested in it because... You know, I learned some interesting stuff from this guy, Alan Adler, and he has uh, like a paper or maybe multiple oh. papers in that. Cool. In that I didn't notice that. Book. And I know, but also Noam Elkins has some stuff. Uh -huh. there. But yep. there's also there's also other interesting people. Uh, but, but also, uh, also this. <laughs> uh, there's also all sorts of good things about this book. And if I, if if I could understand more of the book, that I could tell you more about you know, whether the stuff in it is good or is not good. But in addition to having a lot of good stuff, there's also some like cheesy stuff in it, um, in the sense that like, uh, right, this whole idea of naming the book, calling it the Eightfold Way. I think they got the idea for the book allegedly, or maybe they didn't really get the idea for the book this way, but the, um, somebody created a sculpture of the klein cortic curve. Um, and, uh, is that guy named Robinson? I don't know. You mean the sculptor? <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm, I'm not sure. I, 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 I may have known at one point, but I, yeah. I probably yeah. forgot everything I knew about that. Yeah. Anyway. And, uh -huh. and, and where does the sculpture exist? At Berkeley or something like that? I don't know. Or something, some place yeah. where, yeah. Some place uh, that you've probably been to or something like that. But, um, and so it's cheesy? Well, I mean, it's about as cheesy as, uh, what's his name, calling Murray Gelman um, used to talk about the Eightfold Way, just because the adjoint representation of SU2 is eight-dimensional. Right. You know, so there was this eight basic, I was going to say baryons or something, I, whatever. There was this octuplet. Uh, yeah, that yeah. played some role in whatever. <laughs> yeah, it was this whatever SU gauge theory that was. Yep, yeah, SU three. Yeah. Oh, I said SU three. I said SU two. I should said SU three. Right. Yeah. Okay. So. Okay, so the cheesiness was just like just ripping off of uh, Buddhist. Yeah. So if you find so if you find an eight showing up and say, "Aha, we'll call this the eightfold way." I mean, right. you see what their eight is in this book. It really is kind of cheesy. It's something like. Uh, you know, you have the the Klein quartic is a modular curve, and it's a very modular curve. You know, it's like a famous modular curve for you know for mod seven modular stuff mod modular modular. You know, is modular related to moduli? In this case, it is. You know, there's modulo or modulo modulo seven. <laughs> uh -huh. um, uh, so seven is close to eight. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> it's almost as bad as that. It's, it's the fact that when you look at this quotient of, uh, you know, PSL two Z, it's probably PSL two comma Z mod seven or something like that. Yep. And you yep. write down the generators and relators for this. You use like the same generators as usual or something. But there's one relator where there's a certain thing that's quarter eight. And, you know, so it's like, right, there's this certain way you, you're, you're, you're on the client quartic, it's tiled by these tiles or something. You do like a double uh -huh. twist or something, and it takes you yeah. to another tile. And it takes, it takes you around to eight tiles. Maybe there's a total of 24, I don't know. Yep. But um, whatever. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it, okay. so <laughs> part of the, right. So, I mean, maybe, you know, maybe, I mean, maybe it's maybe it just a cheesy excuse for creating an interesting book. Um, but, um, and I think some of the people involved in the book took the sensible uh, uh, idea that again, I, ha I haven't really looked at it. I've, I've only just briefly looked at it very recently, but I used to take a look at it. I think there's potentially some very interesting stuff in it. And um, the, the, I mean, one way to think about this book is that you could take any Hegman number and create an equivalent book, you know, right? There should be a separate book for each of the, the Hegner. So for the Hegner number seven, it's the eightfold way. For the Hegner number 163, mm -hmm. it would be the n-fold way where n is some weird number. That's the, the order of this same equivalent yeah. element in PSL yeah. two comma z mod 163. And I, I, I used to know how to calculate that, the order of that element, but I can't remember what it would have been. But uh, yeah, it, but it, roughly speaking, yeah, it's like, Eight is close to seven, right? Or seven is close to eight, or something like that. Uh, but uh -huh. um, so, so let me give you some wild guesses I have about what's going on in the case of the Klein quartic curve, and how we could try to generalize those to arbitrary Hegner numbers. And that would be a sort of partial fulfillment of my alleged plan, right? My alleged plan is to try to understand the. Hegner numbers, the special, well, I'll, I'll, I'll say some more. So, okay. So, some weeks ago, I told you about the Kleinian integers. I know, you, I think you were skeptical about any, whether, whether that's a, an official name or right, one I just made up. But I think it is an official name, the Kleinian integers. I think, think you can find a Wikipedia article on them. I can't even remember what are the Kleinian integers, the supposed Kleinian integers. The Kleinian integers. Oh, that's the. That's where the Hegner Hegner number seven. Uh, so it's the imaginary quadratic number field. That's all about the discriminant negative seven. So it's the square so root of negative seven. Square root of negative. Yeah, seven. Okay. Okay. Uh huh. Uh, again, that would, that would give you sort of like a rectangle, but there's actually a diamond in there. I was yeah. like incredibly yeah. confused yeah. recently, yeah. demoralized because I had forgotten that the square root, I'd forgotten that negative seven was one mod four. I was, I, I, more precisely, I was like demoralized by the fact that seven was not Mod four, and so I was like forgetting right. the square root of negative seven plus one over two was an algebraic integer. That's and right. I know, yeah, I I ran into I was like checking out some stuff about. You just have to get used to making that kind of mistake every day. Of the <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, and, and once you get used to that kind of mistake, it doesn't bother you. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, so I was like checking out the. Really, baby case of the Vey conjectures, which is the Hassock conjectures, which says that, like, when you count points on yes. elliptic curve, you get yes the sum of terms that grow exponentially, and some of them, the terms individually are like algebraic integers to different powers. 
Yeah, so you're pointing out exactly some of the stuff that we should be doing as part of this whole project if we actually have all the time in the world to do this project. All the stuff that you're describing about taking that elliptic curve and doing all that vague conjecture stuff to it. Yeah, so is, I've been doing it, that. It, so yeah. was, that was like an algebra, that was like an elliptic curve over the field with, well, I was looking at it over the, it's an elliptic curve that you could do it over other fields. But yeah, I was counting its points over the field with two elements because that's the easiest. Yes, yes. And then, so, then and then the other other powers of two final right. fields and so on. Yes, yeah. yes, yes, yes. Anyway. And, and, and and again, all this, all this, you know, our, our discussion is incredibly digressive, but <laughs> theoretically we're supposed to unify all these <laughs> things together. What you're saying now is not digressive. It's actually part of the whole point. So go ahead. Were you gonna say more? Yeah. Well no, no, just that I like had completely forgotten that I was connected to the Kleinian integers when I was suffering through this mistake and then eventually catching it. Yeah. Yes. I know. I know. Yes. I have no idea if we're ever going to make these uh, digressive threads unite. Right. 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 So but, let me tell you what I think happens with the Klein quartic and the right. So I, I right. Okay. I, I I think you know I I'm I. I, I I think there really is a Wikipedia article on the Kleinian integers, but the big question is, can you get Wikipedia to admit, maybe, maybe by now it does, or maybe it's not even true, you, can you get Wikipedia to admit that the Kleinian integers is related to the Klein quartic? So I think, you know, the Klein quartic, what genus is that? It's three. Three. Uh, yeah. From the Kleinian integers, you get this genus one thing, this elliptic curve. Uh -huh. Elliptic curve with complex multiplication, this Higner elliptic curve. And I think there's a very nice covering, a very nice way that the Klein quartic wraps around hmm. this uh, this Higner elliptic curve, I think. Don't trust me on any of this, as, as usual. You know, never trust me on it. But that's what I think is going to happen. And that is going to be. Right, so one of the things we're saying there is that here we have this very beautiful elliptic curve with complex multiplication, but we're also saying that in this way, it seems to be a modular curve in some sense, or perhaps just merely a modular elliptic curve. But I, I think it's actually a modular curve. Uh -huh. And um, and this is going to connect with all sorts of things. I mean, like yeah, still got two or three minutes left. So like, there's. Right again. What's the group that involved that's involved here? It's PSL two comma seven. Now, what group is that? Well, that's a group that we're kind of somewhat familiar with. It's, uh, I, if I'm counting correctly, it's got like 168 elements. It's the automorphism group of the Fano plane. Yep. And um, we've actually studied like the irreducible representations of that group. And there's you know if you. Hmm, It's a finite group, but there's this very nice way to understand the representation theory of it. And there are these cuspidal groups and these not. So they're really like these, let's, let's just quick, let's quickly try to do the dimension numerology for the 168, okay? So <laughs> can I quickly sure, stop yeah, sharing fine. and get to the other sharing, three, two. Eventually I should be able to, can you see this thing now? Yep. Okay. So I'm trying to move it down where I can get some blank space here. So what am I trying to say? 168. You have to try to help me guess some good way to express this as a sum of squares. So what okay. is it? It's like 100. <laughs> is that how it's going to go? You're how just going to completely it? guess? Okay. Uh, I mean, Uh, I mean, we have to we have to guess in an intelligent way. So I mean, you know, you have to think you have to try to get it to be the squares of the ear of the dimensions of the ear of this. So I think there's going to be right. It acts on the funnel planes. Right, right, but it's something so that, like. What am but I then that would give you like a. It acts on the funnel plane, but it's um. But, and it acts like doubly transitively, so that like gives you a six-dimensional irreducible representation because six is one less than seven. 
So you should get like six squared coming in. Okay. That's one here, rep. Yeah. I don't know why so you're getting a like 10 a 36. No, no, you're not getting a 10, 10 dimension. Oh, sorry, that is a square, but that's not what I meant. Um, I think it's like 101 plus, maybe 101 plus uh, 67 or something like that. Where am I? What the hell is that? Uh, <laughs> well, let me let me let me try. Uh, uh, one hundred one plus sixty seven. Uh, maybe sixty seven is like forty nine plus nine plus nine. <laughs> is that right? Let's see. So, yeah, maybe there's thirty six and sixty four and one. I'm guessing that's what's going to be. Does that all add up to one sixty-eight? Uh, yes, eighteen and forty-nine is sixty-seven. Yes, it does. So there's the trivial rep. There's yes. the Fano plane rep. So yeah, so these ones here. Yes, yes. I'm, I'm yeah. I, I'm so. I mean, if you if I'm stepping on what you're saying because I'm trying to finish quickly, but you can step on what I'm saying if you feel like it. Um, so I, I'm going to oversimplify, summarize what you're saying is that these ones here, the seven-dimensional representation, one, six, and seven, and eight. Is that right? One, six, and seven, and eight. Those dimensional representations have an, a nice interpretation in terms of the geometry of the Fano plane, stuff like that. So it, it, it has to do with parabolic induction. Uh, you know, parabolic induction is all about flag geometry. Uh -huh. So there's all, everything that you're saying, I'm trying to shoehorn it into using the, the flag geometry of the Fano plane to, um, as material to apply parabolic induction to, and from that, we're going to get these interesting EREPs of these dimensions. And like you said, one of them has some probably has something, I, th I think, I'm guessing, I'm taking wild guesses here. But I think, what, what did you say? You said the seven points of the final, final plane, plane, or equivalently the seven lines of the final plane. And yeah. that was the doubly transitivity, like you did the six, seven. <laughs> yeah, so there should be the point line pairs, I guess. But that seems, yeah, that's. Uh, yeah, but but all let's pretend. Let's just declare victory. Pretend that we understand that. I, I, I'm pretty sure those representations, those EREPs, are going to have an explanation in terms of flag geometry and parabolic induction. Um, but that leaves these mysterious ones that don't have any apparent interpretation in terms uh -huh. of uh, uh, parabolic induction and flag geometry. And and that means that these are sort of atomic with respect to parabolic induct induction. These are you know, generators with respect to parabolic induction. So those are called cuspidal representations or something like that. So these are the cuspidal EREPs of... Uh -huh. Are there not, they're not permutation reps? Are they like... I don't know. Not, I, they're I, not I, defined I, over the, they're not, like, like maybe they're like not defined over the... <clears throat> uh, over the rationals, but only over the complexes or something. You know, one know. of the one of the horrible things here is that I'm mixing up the geometric picture of the Fano plane as you know a projective geometry over Zima two versus it's the same. This it's also the symmetry group of the projective line over Zima seven. So <laughs> those are two incompatible geometric pictures. And what's cuspidal in one picture is probably the opposite of cuspidal in the other picture. <laughs> So in the uh -huh. Fano in the Fano plane picture, it's these three dimensional representations that are the cuspidal ones. Uh -huh. And but I think I think this is one of the things that like Galois was secretly aware of, hundred, hundred, you know, a couple of not quite a couple of hundred years ago, but maybe it was a hundred. I guess just about a hundred, a couple of hundred years ago. But um, uh, <laughs> in this book, in this Eightfold Way book, there are hints that these cuspidal representations of the Fano plane symmetry group, which are also perhaps non-cuspidal representations of PSL2, comma, 
S comma Z mod seven, those are gonna be somehow important in understanding how the Kleinian integers elliptic curve with complex multiplication is covered by this Kleinian quartic modular curve and thereby becomes itself a modular curve. And so this is one of the things I think that's gonna happen with the Kleinian quartic and the Kleinian integers. And perhaps, you know, perhaps we're, the philosophy of this book is that, you know, it's not really about the Kleinian quart Klein quartic. It's really about all these other modular curves, one for each modular, one for each Higner number. And, it, and also about mm -hmm. one elliptic curve for each Higner number. And how this modular curve for the Higner number is a cover of the elliptic curve for that heat number. And maybe by studying these patterns and studying how the, these cuspidal and or non-cuspidal EREPs are entering into the picture, maybe we will begin to understand a lot more of these mystical patterns about how Abelian varieties work and how the Eugentraum work, works and how it relates to the Langlands program and how it relates to the vague conjectures which are part of the Langlands <laughs> program and fitting in the Vey conjectures and all that, with this <laughs> Neron Severi thing and these shears <laughs> and everything, and trying to understand a billion varieties in very concrete ways and fit them onto all these big pictures and try to understand how all these big pictures relate to each other. So sorry, I should kind of quit there. So I'm desperate to hear all the things that you want to tell me about, but I guess we're out of time for today. So yeah, I'll, yeah, I'll, be next time. Next time, I'll be glad to, to tell you a little bit of stuff next time. Yep. Okay. Okay. Maybe we'll, sounds this, like it'd be a good idea for you to start as the expositor next time. Uh, sure. Yeah, that sounds fun. There's probably yeah. zillions of there's probably zillions of things I forgot to tell you as usual, but I think a lot of a lot of the pictures that I wanted to show you, I wanted to show you this movie. Uh, like I say, it reminds me of this uh, Yoko Ono movie. Uh, I don't know that movie. Well, it's like a woman taking a bath and there's a fly and it's several hours long. Maybe it's like six hours long or two hours long or 10 hours long. And I think Yoko Ono said she wanted to see how many people would watch the fly uh, instead of watching the person taking the bath. <laughs> I see. Like there's also, have you ever seen Zorn's Lemma? Um, that was made by uh, the guy who was like maybe the head of the film department at Buffalo when I was at the uh, University of Buffalo with Lovier. And he made this movie called Zorn's Lemma. And uh, we should see if we can find that online, uh, the movie Zorn's Lemma. But there's this whole genre of 60s experimental movies. And this, this like this, really this, long this, and boring movies. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And this yeah. this is what it feels like to me. Yeah. This, uh, this so, I mean, there's like this faucet handy... tripping for uh -huh. okay. an uh -huh. infinite number of hours. Uh huh. Better than there's this Andy on. Warhol movie called Sleep, which is like of him sleeping for eight hours, or someone sleeping for eight hours. Right. I, I, now, not right now. I'm wondering who's actually sleeping. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, there probably yeah. are like excerpts of these on YouTube. I doubt you can get the whole movie. Well, I, I'm hoping Zorn's Lemma might be available in its entirety. I'm not sure if that was a long one, but it's very definitely in the genre of 60s uh, experimental movies. Uh, I can't remember the name of the guy who made uh -huh. them. But um, does it have anything to do with Zorn's Lemma? Well, that's the $64 question. Uh, <laughs> okay. You, you know, they're not going to let. <laughs> <laughs> you have to watch the whole movie <laughs> to find out something like that. Yeah, no spoilers. <laughs> I see. Uh, so yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay. Well, the good news is that yeah. I'm done writing a big wad of papers and okay, getting a bunch of talks ready. That was like making me sort of antsy last month. Sure, sure, and. Um, one of those talks was this talk about motives that I showed you, but I learned more stuff about motives than is in that talk. And yeah, I think that's really going to, you know, contact everything that we're talking about here, uh, according to my grandiose plans. So, so yeah, I'm really anxious to hear about that. 
Okie doke. So I'll okay. see you next okay. week then. Yep. So thanks a lot. I'll, I'll sure. see you next week. Bye. Okay, great. Yep. Okay.